fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I am the first and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Okay, going to do a message today on uh, can a Christian woman rebuke a Christian man? Okay, uh, this is a question I get asked a lot because unfortunately a lot of the preachers in America and around the world are hirelings and you get a woman that goes there and a lot of times they're single or um, you know they're just not married whatever and they are dealing with this man that's a preacher up there in the pulpit and they hear him sp saying heresy and they say okay what are my rights as a Christian woman am I allowed to say anything negative to this man about what he's doing what he's saying how he's deceiving people or am I just supposed to keep my mouth shut well let's look about what the Bible says Turn first, the two ones that you're going to get turned to are 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 1 Timothy chapter 2. So let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verses 34 and 35. You see, if you want to be a Bible believer, your standards need to come from the Word of God. And uh, you can say, well, I feel, I think, I, I kind of talk to people and they say such and such but it comes right down to it it's about what the book says not about your opinions not about my opinions so let's see what the bible says first corinthians chapter 14 verse 34 and 35 says let your women keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted unto them to speak but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law and if they will learn anything let them ask their husbands at home for it is a shame for women to speak in the church Okay, now the other one here, 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to turn there. First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 says, Let the women, or let the woman, excuse me, learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So there you have it. Open and shut case. Women are subhuman, essentially, when compared to men, and they should be beaten and kicked around and mocked and made fun of. So that's it. Thank you for watching, right? Uh, no. That would be more like Islam. That's not the system that God set up. God did not set up a system where women are to be put down. That's not the point of these two verses. You see, there's an old saying, and I've said it before in other studies, but I'm going to say it one more time because it bears repeating, and that is a text without a context is a pretext. Now, see, if you would look at those two, those, excuse me, those four verses, two from each chapter there, you know, the 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Timothy chapter 2, if you look at those verses as they stand, well, you could use it to say women are never allowed to speak. But what's the context? What's going on there? Well, let's turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And we're going to actually read the context of what is going on there, why Paul is writing these things to the Corinthian believers. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And we're going to begin at verse 21 to get into the proper context. Okay? It says here, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, you remember, anytime you see a wherefore in a verse, that it starts out wherefore, that verse is tying itself into the verse that preceded it. Okay, so it says wherefore. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Interesting, because what do the Pentecostal Charismatics say? Have you received the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking in unknown tongues? Uh, no, I received the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost when I got saved, and I began to love truth. That's the real initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> um, 
But it's interesting because they try to make it a sign for believers. It's not for believers. It's for the unbelieving Jews. And you mark it down, you listen to my study on tongues, you look at it, every single time that tongues appears in the New Testament, Jews are always present. Why? Because the Jews require a sign. So, it's given to the believers there in the early centuries to confirm the word to the Jews. That's what's going on there. But, you see, what kind of a sign gift would it be for somebody, you know, you get this Orthodox Jew and he's over here and all of a sudden he sees this Gentile like me walking by. And I look at him and I say to him in perfect Hebrew, Jesus Christ is your Messiah and you people rejected him as a nation of Israel and you need to, you know, get saved. The blood of your bulls and goats is never going to take away sin, only the blood of Jesus Christ. And I said it in perfect Hebrew. Would the Jew be impressed? <laughs> yes, you know. That's what was going on back there in the first century. You had Gentiles as well as other Jews and things that were speaking other tongues to confirm the word to the Jews. Okay, it serves for those that don't believe. All right, prophesying is there for those that believe. It edifies the body of Christ. You hear about some kind of, pro of a prophetic thing that means that the rapture could be very near. You go, really? Wow, that's neat. That's exciting. See, so... I do believe that there are some of these things that are still there, but this charismatic speaking in tongues thing, it's just not there. There went my notes. Oh, the joys of preaching outdoors. It's probably in the 20s out here right now, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's a little chilly, but uh, not going to stop me. I don't have enough sense to come in out of the cold. But uh, let's continue here. Now look at verse 23. Now this is another one that they'll use a lot of times. People will use to say that you should have a church building. But we'll see about that. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? Well, look at the average modern Pentecostal church. You get somebody, you know, church building, I realize, not a real church, but... You get somebody that comes in there that's, that's unbelieving or somebody that watches a Pentecostal video where they're all, you know, hush, lush, untie, untie, bow tie, they're doing this thing. People think they're mad. They think they're crazy. See? But you say, but see, Brian, it says that there that the church is to come together into one place. Okay. Then how could the church there be a building? Was the church not together if it's a building? You know, was there some two-by-fours over here and a, some roof metal over there and a couple bricks over here and they, they're to come together into one place? See, that verse, that's a dumb verse to go to if you're trying to tr prove a church building. Okay? And, you know, I understand. People say, well, you know, what if we meet in an old barn or something like that? Well, whatever. You know, it's just it's a danger when you start to make the building and you call that the church and you start to add all the Roman Catholic flavors and traditions and stuff in there and an altar and a raised pulpit and all this stuff. You start to get dangerous when you do that. But anyhow, back to the subject here. I'm rabbit trailing. Verse 24, But if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. How is it then, brethren, here's another one that the, that the charismatic house church people will try to use to prove that there should never be a man in authority, which is not true. We'll see about that. But they say, how is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, that all things be done unto edifying. So they actually say that that's Paul commending them because everybody was involved. Read the context. He's saying, how is it then, brethren? You know, it's a question. He's saying, why are you doing this? He's not saying, hey, you're really doing it right. He's saying, why are you doing this? How is it then, brethren? See, that's not a, a, a uh, commendation. It's a condemnation there. Verse 27, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. 
But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Now look at verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. What was going on in Corinth? You had people, anybody, men, women, people that were speaking other tongues, other languages is another way to say it. And they were all standing up and they were all speaking. It was confusion. And Paul says, how is it then, brethren? Every one of you has a doctrine. Every one of you has a psalm, has a prayer, has a, has a testimony, has a this. You're all standing up. There's no order. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason to it, as they say. You know, it's just, you're all over the place. You know, nobody's taking charge. Nobody's coming in there and saying, hey, whoa, whoa, let's, let's get a little organization here. They all just come together and it's chaos. You know, it's interesting because I went to this big modern contemporary Babel building the one time. And this guy stands up, they had lay preachers, you know, which is fine, you know, it's good to have multiple elders. But this guy stands up and he was reading out of the New Living Translation and it was given this sissy little sermon about how that we all should give money and we should make sure our tithing, you know, is there and blah, blah, blah. And he's standing up front and I'm way, I'm way in the back of this congregation. It was a big, huge, modern Babel building. And I'm sitting back there and I'm looking out across this crowd, I don't even want to call it a congregation, and they're all talking, they're having a good time, they're, you know, and I, I mean, just turn to each other. So how are things going at work, John? Oh, pretty good. You know, it's going pretty good. And, and did you, have you been down to the new store yet? No, I've been down. I was going to get down there this week, but maybe I'm going to try to get down there this coming week. They weren't even listening to the preacher. Kind of like the church at Corinth. You get some guy over here and he's like, hey, everybody, I want to tell you about my missionary journey. I want to, I want to tell you. I want to speak about it. I want to speak. Some lady over here stands up and she goes, oh, I just want to thank God for the amazing things that he's done in this world. And, oh, thank you, Lord. And, and some guy over here stands up and he says, onward, Christian soldier. You know, I realize it was written later. later. I'm just acting. They're all doing different things. And Paul says, you're, this is confusion, you know, and it's like these these modern house church people. They'll go, they'll go. Oh, it's just so nice to be in the organic church, you know, and and how everybody just does whatever they feel like doing, and and somebody will stand up and and give a word of testimony, and this woman stands up and preaches, and this man stands up and sings a song, and everybody joins in, and oh, it's so wonderful. No, it's confusion. All right, and we're going to see here later on that things are to be done decently and in order. There's to be order to God's services. When the assembly of the saints come together, there should be order there. I mean, what are we on earth for? You say, uh, to go to our local Bible building and to gossip about uh, people when they're not there and, and talk about business and worldly things? Uh, no, that's what the Kiwanis Club and the Lions Club and the Rotary Club and, and you know restaurants and social gatherings, that's what they're for. Um, the Church of Jesus Christ is here on a military mission. You say, what's that? The Ministry of Reconciliation. That's why we're here. And yet, how many of these Babel buildings do you go to and that's never brought up? You know? I mean, hey, I tried out some kind of new tracting this week. Really? What was it? Well, let's, you know, let me show you. Hey, do you guys want to come out with me this weekend? Yeah, let's get it planned. Hey, can you provide the tracks? Yeah, okay, let's get this done. Hey, did, did you get those shipment of Bibles in yet? How many churches are like that? Few, if any, I've ever been to. You know? See, we need to get back to the way this thing is. We've gone right back to this Corinthian-style movement right here. But you see there, Paul is not commending them, as I said. Now, if the men are standing up, and they're all speaking and things like this. Paul is saying, it's real bad for you men to be doing it, but even worse is it for the women to be standing up and taking charge. Why? It's not the place of a woman. We're going to see that as we continue in the study. 
But 34 and 35 here says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. The church there is a reference to the body of Christ coming all together and assembling. All right? It's a called out assembly. That's what the word means. Verse 36. What came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. If people don't want to listen to what I'm saying in this study, if you just want to do your own thing and not care what the Bible says, well, if you're ignorant, then be ignorant. Just as simple as that. Verse 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Is there supposed to be order? Yes, there is supposed to be order among the body of Christ. When the assembly of the saints comes together, you're supposed to have the elders of that assembly, the older men who know the Bible, who have been through some things in life, those men are supposed to say, okay, everybody, let's get started. We're going to start out with hymn number such and such, if you have a hymn book, or we're going to start out with this song, let's sing this. And then brother so-and-so is going to tell us of his missionary work this week. And brother so-and-so is going to do this, and brother so-and-so is going to do that. Oh, then women are being put down. No, no, women are not being put down. It's just that God has set an order there. This is the way things are supposed to be according to the Word of God. All right? And Paul is coming into these Corinthians, and he's saying, you are wrong because every one of you is standing up and doing things. It's not supposed to be that way. Things are supposed to be done decently and in order, and the women aren't supposed to be speaking in the meeting. It's a shame for them to be standing up and speaking. So, now let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to see here how the Lord has set up His system here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 33. Okay, it says here, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. Who is the head of the church? You say the IRS through section 501c3? <laughs> no, no, uh, the head of the church is supposed to be Jesus Christ, okay? Supposed to be, he sometimes gets dethroned, you know, by people. Uh, either the government comes in and says, we'll take over, or you get some puffed up hireling up there that's ranting and raving, you know, some of the videos I've brought out showing some of these guys, you know, they get an attitude and think that they're the head of the church. They're not. But uh, if Jesus Christ is the head of the church... Jesus Christ is a man, um, then who should be the one who's up there leading things? You say a woman because Mary is our mediatrix. Uh, no, sorry, I'm not a Catholic. No, it's supposed to be Jesus Christ as the head of the church and a male pastor. That's the way God set it up. You say, I don't like it, then take it up with God. That's the way it's supposed to be. And you say, well, then I guess women aren't as good as men. That's not what's going on here. It's not that women are inferior to men. Women are different than men. God has different purposes than men. You say, well, then I guess a woman can never rebuke a, a man, can never question a man. Well, just stick with me here. I'm going to show you that if it's done the biblical way, yes, they can. Okay? But let's continue here. Verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. 
For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So you see there the proper order within marriage, and it also is compared and related to the church. All right? What do you have? The hierarchy. God. Jesus Christ. God and Jesus are the same, but it says well, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, or the man Christ Jesus, excuse me. So you have God, Jesus, husband, wife, children. You see, that's how God set things up. That's how it's supposed to be. And you say, well, then, uh, women, uh, they, see, I'm seeing it again, though, Brian, because women are lesser spiritually than men, right? No. Actually, there's equality. Let me show you. Galatians chapter 3. Turn here to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 verse 27 says here, For as many of you as have put, excuse me, for as many of you has, as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So, how does God see things? Does God look down and say, Boy, I sure love those Christian men. They're really good. Those women, they're lousy. Boy, I wish I wouldn't have any saved women under me. Well, when they get up here to heaven, I'm just going to, you know, use them as, you know, fornication toys for the men or something like Mormonism teaches or Islam teaches. Uh, no, the Lord looks down and he says, you're all one in Christ Jesus. You say, well, wait a second here. Over here it says that the man is to be the head of the wife, but then over here it says that there's no difference between male and female. Yeah, spiritually speaking. But on the earth, there is a difference. The woman is supposed to reverence her husband. You see, that's how God has set things up. But in Christ, there's neither male nor female. All right? In the spiritual realm, a woman has the same, she'll have the same rewards as a man, okay, in eternity. It's not going to be like, oh, you get up there and the Lord's going to be, oh, sorry, you're a woman. <laughs> You'll not be rewarded. No. The woman looks at the Bible and she says, okay, what are my instructions? What are my marching orders as a Christian lady? And the man looks and he says, you know, what are my marching orders as a man? You know, I mean, if I get up to heaven and I say, I'm here for my rewards. And the Lord says, well, what'd you do for me? Well, I was a virtuous woman and I was a keeper at home and um, I bore children and I guided the house. The Lord would say, um, uh, Brian, those things were written to women. You know, well, yeah, but I'm just as good as a woman. See? <laughs> no, those are your responsibilities, ladies. Um, so why then would you want to act like a man and try to usurp the authority of a man and try to be like a man and, and do what men are trying to do? You know, it doesn't work. And again, you know, you say, well, then, Brian, you're saying that women can't rebuke men. I didn't say that. You know, what was going on there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is Paul was saying the men are to be the leaders there in the group. Women should remain silent when the group comes together. All right? Not all the time. Just when you're together, meeting together, the assembly of the saints. I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Turn next to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to start here at verse 5 to get into the proper context. 
Okay, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, as I said earlier, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ, and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath and doubting. You know, that's one thing that Christian men have a very hard time with. Not doing things with wrath and doubting. Boy. <laughs> you know, there have been many times I do things out of wrath when I should be doing things out of love. You know, there are many times that I act in ways towards my wife out of wrath instead of love. And there are many times I doubt things that she's doing. And it you know, you say, oh, it's just with your wife. No, there are times I do that same thing with the Lord. There's sometimes I'll pray to the Lord about something and I start doubting. But it says there that we're to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. That's, you know, easy to say, hard to put into practice. But that's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're called to do as men. Now look at verse 9. In like manner also, you know, it's kind of like saying wherefore, in like manner also, so women are also supposed to be doing these things, you know, not having wrath and doubting, they're to be praying, but in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. You know, and it's it's come to... Uh, my attention, my sermon on modest apparel, I cover a lot about women, but I don't really say a whole lot about men. Uh, there are ways that you can dress immodestly as a man as well. I just thought I need to say that because some I got you know kind of kicked around for that and they were right. Um, there are some things that you can do as a man to draw attention to your body. Uh, don't do that. Okay, um, It's not right. If you're causing somebody to lust, you're in sin. But you see there that a woman is to adorn herself. Her beauty is supposed to come from her personality, from who she is. All right, Her shamefacedness and sobriety. A woman is supposed to be sober. She's not supposed to be really super duper outgoing and, and whatever else. There's to be some sobriety there. That's important. Verse 11. Now here we see it. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and, Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now I'm not going to go into all those verses there, the last three, because I already covered it in my study on 1 Timothy chapter 2. But the fact of the matter is, what you're seeing here is not that the woman is totally put down and can never say to a man, hey, wait a second there, you're wrong about this, or you're wrong about that. That's not what's going on there. What's going on is Paul is saying, when it comes to saints getting together, when it comes to authority there, the woman is to be in a silent shamefaced sobriety you know she's supposed to be in a role like that all right why well first Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 10 this is a true saying if a man desire the office of a bishop he desire if they good work a bishop then must be blameless the husband of one wife sorry rules out all female pastors um, vigilant, sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall under the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil." Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Well, there you go. Okay, So you have all men 
there in the whole system. And uh, women are not even mentioned, right? No, let's continue. Verse 11. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Well, uh, if she's not supposed to talk, how could she be known as not being a slanderer? Huh. So then a woman should be able to speak to people in certain situations and known to be honest. Yeah. A Christian lady is supposed to have a ministry. You know, I mean, uh, God's committed unto, unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Is that for men only? Or is it for men and women? Well, in the terms of when you get together in the assembly of the saints, well, sure. It's supposed to be, you know, the men in charge of the thing. You see that there in 1 Timothy chapter 3. There's no room for female pastors or female deacons. But the fact of the matter is, that's when the saints get together. That's the context of this thing. So, you know, it doesn't mean that a woman is never allowed to say anything. Okay, otherwise, you know, why well, say a, a, the wife of a deacon is not to be a slanderer? Um, there are times and places where she can and should speak up. We're going to be getting into that as we continue here. Now, are there any examples of women speaking and teaching men in your Bible? Well, turn first to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Okay, it says here, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, was at, which is at Sancria. Then ye, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succour of many, and of myself also. Succour in the King James Bible means a helper. Okay. Um, so she is a great helper there. She's a servant of the church, which is at Sencrea. So could she do that and just be silent? No. There are times a woman like that should speak. There are times a woman like that, you know, um, I think there was another time, I think it was Phoebe, where, you know, Paul was whipped and stuff, and, and I think it was her that was like there, you know, fixing up his wounds and everything. You know, she's probably giving him some words of exhortation. A woman can know the Bible. A woman can understand things like that and can be there to exhort. Even a man like Paul, you know, just because Paul is in a very high position, he's, you know, the Apostle Paul and everything, doesn't mean that he, you know, don't speak to me, woman, you know. That's not what's being condemned in the Bible. What's being condemned is when you have the assembly of the saints and a woman stands up and speaks down to the men. That's all that's being condemned in the New Testament. In the Bible. Women are not supposed to be in charge. That doesn't mean that they can't correct a man when they see him in error. And let me just say this. For you uh, ladies out there that are married. You know, the ones that have been married for a while already know about this. But uh, newly married or soon to be married. Um, the Bible says that you're to reverence your husband as unto Christ. You know. But what you're going to find out is your husband's not Jesus Christ. Not even close. <laughs> and you're going to find out that your husband falls flat on his face quite often. Now, what you need to do is you need to say at those points in time, my husband's wrong here. And if he's wrong and he's not in line with the Bible, well, I can't go along with what he's saying. But I can't usurp his authority either. I don't want to put him down. I don't want to tear him down and overstep my bounds as, a, as his wife. So what can I do to help my husband get through this? You see, marriage is not the man as the strong tower and the woman as the, you know, she's kind of the weak one that comes along. I know she's the weaker vessel. I know the Bible teaches that. But there are many times when it's the man who's also weak. 
And the woman is stronger in some ways. See, marriage is about two people being together. You say the, the, the wife is the weaker vessel. Yeah, but God said about Adam, he said, it's not good that the man should dwell alone. I'll make an help, or be alone. I'll make an help meet for him. So God looked at Adam and he said, hey, it's not good that he's alone. I'll make him a helper. You know? So as a Christian couple, the two of you need to come together and help each other. It's very important. But uh, the thing of Phoebe there, you know, being a, a servant of the church, it's interesting because I've heard this thing about Phoebe being a deaconess, you know. I've, I've heard that. I don't know if anybody out there has ever heard of this thing or not. But you say, where are they getting this teaching from? I mean, it's obvious there. You don't see the word deaconess anywhere there, which is a servant of the church here, which is at Sancria. And, uh, you know, it says, what's her business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succurer of many. Nowhere does it say anything about her being a deacon or a deaconess. And I've heard this thing. People say, yeah, but women can be deacons or deaconesses. Where'd that come from? Well, if you have an Amplified Bible, it says there in, in uh, verse 1, Now I introduce and commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deaconess of the church at Sincrea. Hmm. The new version's messing up doctrine. Imagine that. Contemporary English version. I have good things to say about Phoebe, who is a leader in the church at Sincrea. A leader. She's not just a deacon. She's a leader. Isn't that wonderful? How about the Common English Bible? <clears throat> I'm introducing our sister Phoebe, Phoebe to you, who's a servant of the church in Sincrea. Footnotes, it goes down and it says, or deacon. Servant or deacon. English Standard Version, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant. Footnote goes down, or deaconess. <laughs> New International Version, I love this one. I commend to you our servant, or our, our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sincrea. Footnote, it goes down, it says, or servant. <laughs> What? So you have the King James saying servant, and a lot of these new versions say servant, but they'll footnote say deacon. The NIV puts it in the text that it's deacon, and footnotes and says, or servant. These new versions, I'll tell you what, they're so messed up. New Revised Standard Version, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church of Sincrea, and the footnote says, or minister. How about that one? You wonder why a lot of these sodomite women preachers, you know, and I do mean sodomites, you know, I'm not just being sarcastic there. There are sodomite pastors now that are female, and you wonder why a lot of them are ministers, you know, and they, and they use this New Revised Standard Version. Well, right there, because the New Revised Standard Version doesn't condemn their sin. But let's continue here. Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, verse 24 through 28. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Okay? And it, we aren't going to read the rest of the verses there. But uh, it said there, Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Why didn't it say that Aquila was commanded to be silent and went in and washed the dishes while, you know, I'm sorry, Priscilla. Why didn't it say that Priscilla was commanded to be silent while Aquila preached to the Apollos there, to the man Apollos? No. You see, they weren't in the situation where the assembly of the saints were. See, Priscilla didn't stand up and say, okay, now it's time to do some preaching. You know, and that, that cracks me up. You see a lot of these female pastors, and a lot of times they'll, ask, they'll act real masculine. They lose their femininity. Try and act like a man, you know, because the proper position of a elder is a man. But that's another issue. But, you know, the fact is they're like, you know, here you have this godly couple and they're actually instructing a man, the two of them. Sitting down together with him and showing him the Bible and showing him, taking him through the scriptures. 
You say, what's, this, the, what's the deal with this Aquila and Priscilla? How did they learn the Bible? We'll turn back to verse 1 there in chapter 18. Okay, it says here, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and Greeks. So Paul knew these two people personally and lived with them for a while. This couple. I bet they learned a few things. <laughs> and you say, well, uh, oh, sure, you know, just had some conversations. No, it went more than that. Look at verse 18 there in chapter 18. It says here, And Paul after this tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, hmm. having shorn his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So not only did they stay with Paul for a while, or they let Paul stay with them, they learned from him, they also went on one of his journeys with him. I bet they learned a few things. In fact, I bet they learned enough things that they could teach somebody else, like Apollos, which is exactly what they did. You read about it down there in verse 24, down through the end of the chapter. Very interesting. But uh, why did Aquila take Priscilla with him on that journey? Wouldn't that have been kind of dangerous for his wife? Yeah. But you see, they were a couple that was committed to the cause of Jesus Christ. So the two of them went out together. He didn't say, honey, I'm sorry, you're going to have to stay here. You're just a woman. You dumb, stupid, poor little creature, you. God thinks so low of you, and so do I. Therefore, you stay here and cook and clean, and I'm going to go do these things myself. You just stay out of it because you're too dumb to understand about it. Is that what he said? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's not what the Bible teaches. And if, if you're believing that as a woman... That's wrong. And if I've led you to believe that, then I apologize. And, and, you know, the Lord thinks very highly of women. I think very highly of women. I think that there are some very spiritual women out, women out there. My wife, she's very spiritual. She challenges me a lot in the ministry. If you haven't seen her testimony yet, watch it. You know, I mean, there are some very godly women out there. Very amazing godly women. And to say that they can never say anything against a man to correct a man. Um, my wife has saved me from some serious errors because of the fact that she has spoken to me in a loving, godly way. She comes to me in a reverent, respectful way. And if I'm doing something really stupid, well, sometimes she'll, you know, have to raise her voice a little bit at me <laughs> to get through the thick skull here. But the fact of the matter is, she's here in my life to help me. That's what she's for. Now, if she's here to help me, couldn't there be Christian sisters out there that are there to help the body of Christ? Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Interesting here too, we're not going to turn here, but Romans chapter 16 verses 3 through 5 says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their 501c3 building. <coughs> Excuse me, it says house. Sorry. Salute my well-beloved Epinetus, who is the first roots of Achaia, unto Christ. So you see, it wasn't just that Aquila and Priscilla did some nice things for Paul and then they went back and they were making plenty of money with the tent making thing. They were servants of Jesus Christ. The team, the man and the woman. And she wasn't standing there like this the whole time that Aquila was preaching. She wasn't standing there like this while he's witnessing to people. They said, what's your deal? I'm not allowed to speak. No, there were times when she, I'm sure, was saying, yeah, backing up what my husband said, this one time we were with Paul, honey, you probably, you, you didn't mention this, but remember that time we were with Paul and we saw that guy, that, and he, oh yeah, that's right, you tell him the story. See, there's nothing wrong with that.
Very interesting. But now let's turn to one more place in the Bible and then we're done. Esther chapter 4. There are two books in the Bible that are actually named after women, godly women. So if you're a woman, you should do well to go to these books and study the lives of these two women and see how they acted around men and see how they lived before the Lord and learn from their example. Okay, Esther chapter 4. If you don't know this story, it's a, it's a real good one. You ought to read it. Um, but uh, Esther chapter 4. We're going to read down through here. And basically what you have here is you have this wicked guy. He's a descendant of um, Ham, essentially. He's a Hamite. And his name is Haman. And he is plotting to kill the Jews. Okay, and he gets this whole thing worked out how he's going to kill all the Jews. Or verse four, or chapter four, verse one. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry, and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai, and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend unto her, or upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai unto the, the street of the city, which was brought before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him, and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make request before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai, um, all the king's servants and all the people, and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. And they told uh, to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai came to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement, enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house uh, be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther, then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer, Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink the three days, night or day. I also and my maids, maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went uh, his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Okay? Let me just stop there for a minute. Did when Mordecai said to Esther, "Hey, you got to talk to the king," why didn't Esther exert herself as a strong woman? I mean, she's the queen after all. You know, go on into the king and tell him what's going on. Why didn't she do that? Because she said this isn't the right thing to do. According to the law, I'm not allowed to go in there and tell my husband something or else. I can't talk to the king that way. Interesting, because Jesus Christ is to be our king, and the Bible said that the woman is to reverence her husband as unto Christ. So, be careful how you speak to Christ, your king, you know. Interesting. But, you see there, she didn't just say, 
Oh, I'm sorry, I'm a woman, I can't speak to him. She didn't say that, and she didn't also say, well, yeah, I'll go tell him off, you know. There was a proper protocol there. There was a proper way to do things. See. But let's continue. Chapter 5. Read down to verse 5 here. It says, Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. And Esther, and Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. All right. Now we're not going to keep reading here. Um, but you can read the rest of the story. And what happens is, Esther basically deceives this Haman guy, first of all, to honor uh, Mordecai, or Mordecai, there's different ways to say it, but she deceives him into having to be forced to honor him, and then she actually deceives Haman into coming and thinking he's being honored, in reality, she tells on him, and the king turns in wrath towards Haman and says, kill that man. And Haman is killed. And his house and everything too. You know? So a woman, in other words, was able to come to a man and speak to him. In a certain way. But see, she didn't come in there and say, Now let me tell you, buddy boy. She didn't do that. There was a certain protocol there. And she came and she said, Hey, let me, let me just say this thing and, and I'll pray about this and stuff. And because of her doing it that way, God blessed that. You say, what's the modern day example to that, Brian? Well, let's just say a woman is going to a Babel building someplace, and she's a single woman. She has no husband to defend her, and she's there. And the pastor stands up and he says, now the Bible's a good book, but it's just allegorical, or there are better translations, or a better rendering would be. Does that woman have a right to stand up in the church and say, in that assembly there, and say, you wicked devil, you, how dare you speak those things against the holy word of God? You don't know the thing. You're a part of the Alexandrian cult. And blah, 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 blah. Does she have a right to say that? No. She's a woman. She doesn't have the right to say that. She does not have a right to overstep her bounds as a woman, a godly woman. Well, then she should keep her peace, right? Well, let's just go with that for a second. So this woman decides, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut because it's commanded me not to speak in church. So she goes to walk out, and that pastor's there at the back door, and he says, Oh, hello, sister so-and-so. What would you think of the sermon? What's she going to say? See, if she goes with the philosophy that she's commanded to be silent, then it's going to be like, Well, I can't say what I truly believe. Because that's speaking, I'll be rebuking a man of God. So, but, but then she has to lie. And she has to say, oh, well, it was good. You know, that's a lie. It wasn't good. What she should do at that point is what Esther did. What's Esther say? She's there and, and Mordecai comes and he says, you got to do something. You got to speak to this guy. And she goes, okay, let me pray about it. And if you're a woman right now and you're in a situation where you'd like to say something to a pastor, a man, pray about it. And if the Lord gives you that opportunity, then you come to him in a meek and quiet spirit with shamefacedness and sobriety. And you come to him and you say, I'm not trying to wreck the flock here. I'm not trying to rule things or whatever. But I got to tell you, what you're saying is wrong. What you're saying is a sin. And I cannot be part of this congregation. I cannot be part of this place here until you come out and you believe the book that you preach from. There's nothing wrong with that. And ladies, if you're out there in the world, you're out shopping or something like that, your husband's at work or you're out doing whatever else, and a man 
says something to you or whatever else, and you sense it's, a, it's an open door for the Lord to speak through you, to witness, witness for Jesus Christ. Now, don't go out of your way. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, as a woman, I wouldn't go to a, a bar or something like that and walk in. I mean, you know, be careful about that. You know, you, you do need to be careful as a woman, cause there, especially because there's some really rotten men out there. But the fact of the matter is, you do have the right to speak to men. And, you know, if you see some guy and he's up there and he's just lying to you and he's defending the Catholic Church and a whole bunch of other stuff, understand there's a good chance you're not even going to be rebuking a Christian man. Rebuking a lost hireling is not the same thing as rebuking a Christian man. You know? If you see a man that's truly saved and, and a very godly preacher and he's up there and he's in error or something and you come to him in a meek and quiet spirit and you say, oh, brother so-and-so, uh, um, doesn't the Bible say this? Can you please explain this verse to me? You know? Um, you said that the King James Bible is just a translation. Um, well, brother, um, then why does it say sanctify them through thy truth? Thy word is truth. What is thy word? What is the word of God? If it's not this book, what is it? See, that's the way you come to them. What's being condemned in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 1 Timothy chapter 2 is a woman standing up and preaching to the assembly. See, that's what's being condemned. But if you as a woman, as a godly woman, you see some man that's in, that's in error, gross doctrinal error, and you can show him the truth, you come to him in a meek and quiet spirit and you say, brother, let me explain something to you. You know, here's a Paulus out there on the street corner and he's going, you know, John baptized and stuff and we need to be baptized and blah, blah, blah. And, and Aquila and Priscilla look over at him and they go, you know, what's this guy? <laughs> you know, he's very fervent. We need to, you know, and they say, oh, excuse me, come here. <laughs> you know, they take him under them and they say, oh, we need to expound unto you the way of God more perfectly. Well, who are you? Well, uh, we've been with the Apostle Paul. Who's that? Well, we got a lot of things to explain to you. Come on over this way. <laughs> and they take him over and they expound to him the scriptures. You know, they give him the word of God. There are some great godly ministries like that. There are some good Aquila and Priscilla ministries out there that are like that. That's what my wife and I are striving to be. We're striving to be a modern day Aquila and Priscilla. We both want to be servants of the Lord. I'm lacking in certain areas, and she's lacking in certain areas. I can help her with the, her, her areas where she's lacking. She can help me in the areas where I'm lacking. See, that's what we should all strive for. If you're saved and you're married to somebody who's saved, the two of you need to work together to serve Jesus Christ. It's not about we both have our own agenda and things like this, and I got it, you know. There again, you know, if you see a man in error and he's your husband, don't say, ha ha, I can get you, I can tear you down. Uh-uh. You say, how can I help my husband? How can I lift him up? How can I build my house? See, that's what you do. And you see a brother in Christ, you say, how can I build the brother up? Hey, here's a pastor, a man who should know better than to say what he's been saying. He's in error. How can I help this man out? How can I come along and lovingly, sweetly, meekly rebuking the guy to get him back on the right track? So, what's the conclusion of the matter? The conclusion of the matter is, can a woman, Christian woman, rebuke a saved Christian man? Yes, if it's done in the right spirit. Absolutely. You say, well, uh, I don't believe a Christian woman should be in ministry. Well, you're off your rocker. Uh, we're all called to a ministry of reconciliation. If you are a single woman and you are going to a building someplace and, and things and you see the pastor is starting to teach things that are anti-scriptural, then leave. Leave. You say, well, then what would I do? Well, serve the Lord with your life. You know, go on out, put out tracks. You don't have to be out on the street corners preaching the word or something like that. Go put out tracks. Witness to friends and family. You know, do what you can for the Lord. But don't get this attitude, you know, that 
the Bible's putting you down and putting you into some kind of a subordinate role where you're no good. That isn't it. It's just the Lord has a system set up and you have to submit yourself to that system. You know? And it's a very blessed, <coughs> excuse me, a very blessed thing. I thank the Lord for the wife that he brought, you know, into this ministry for me. I'll be very honest with everybody out there. I was getting to the point where I was saying, I don't think I can do this much longer. And I begged the Lord, I prayed to the Lord, Lord, please give me somebody that can help me with this. And he did. So that's going to be it. Um, we're going to be bringing out some pre-trib rapture moments probably next week. They'll be out. Uh, so look forward to that. Uh, we're in the process of, of, there's a lot of details and things going on with moving and whatever else. And so we're working on that. We'll keep you posted. But uh, please keep praying for the ministry. Keep praying for my wife and I as we serve Jesus Christ with our lives. And I guess that's going to be it for now. Thank you so much for watching.